Welcome to Unpacking the Mass. My name is Keith Nestor. Today we're going to be looking at the readings for the seventh Sunday in Ordinary Time. And there's one clear theme that we're going to see in these readings, and it begins with the first, basically the first words of our first reading from Leviticus 19. We're just going to jump in, and then you'll see what we're called to do and ultimately how we're called to live this out. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the whole Israelite community and tell them, Be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So we're going to stop right there, but there's more. This is the theme, right? Holiness. That's what we must start with if we want to follow God, if we want to follow the Lord and step into our faith with all that we have, we've got to be holy. And unfortunately, sometimes holiness is sort of the last thing that people want to talk about. Everybody wants to argue about doctrine and about who's right and who's wrong and all of the right things you're supposed to know and understand, but it boils down to this simple concept of holiness. Now, I said simple, but I didn't say that it was easy, and we're going to see why it's not easy as we continue in this first reading and on to the other readings. Here we go. You shall not bear hatred for your brother or sister in your heart. Though you may have to reprove your fellow citizen, do not incur sin because of him. Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against any of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Okay, you see why this is difficult, right? Because holiness just isn't about you and Jesus. I know everyone's like, oh, do you have your personal relationship with Jesus? And it's just me and Jesus. Well, that's great. But if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, Jesus is going to tell you that it's not just about you and Jesus. It's about you and Jesus and everybody else. And how we treat other people deals with who we are in Christ and what God is doing in us. And our holiness is directly related to how we treat one another. And as we're going to see in this text, it has to deal with how we treat our, our neighbors. But it, we're also going to see later in the gospel how we treat even our enemies, right? Think about this. It's, it's a spectrum of people that we deal with, right? We deal with some people that we would say are super close to us, and then other people that we're kind of friendly with, other people we don't know. And then there's even this other group of people that would call themselves our enemies. And we, you know, we don't like to think about it that way, but we probably all have people that have done evil to us or that don't like us or whatever. How do we treat them? Our holiness encompasses all of these. And in this text, he's saying, don't have any hatred for your brother or sister in your heart. Now he's talking to people who are our fellow Israelites, but for all of us, it might be might mean people who are part of our faith. I, I made a tweet the other day on Twitter that basically just said, imagine the witness we could have if we as Catholics would just stop being mean to each other. Harmless enough. Because the truth is, I see a lot of Catholics just, especially on social media, being very mean to each other, you guys. And it's almost like a sport. How can Catholics be mean to one another? For a variety of reasons. They don't like the way they do this. They go to a different mass. They like a different guy or whatever this or whatever that. People just love to be the one who's like, oh, yeah, well, that guy, dot, 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 or whatever. And it gets really frustrating. It gets really tiring. And I don't feel like it's very Christ-like. Because if we are supposed to be of the same mind and of the same faith and brothers and sisters, we should be treating each other with love, not ridiculing and condemning one another. So there's that part of it, right? People say, oh, but wait a minute, Keith. And I, I, it was funny. I even had people who took issue with my tweet because they were like, no way. I should be allowed to rebuke and, and whatever to people. And, and really what I thought was funny was they wanted to defend the ability to be mean to someone on the grounds of doctrinal issues. And I was thinking, well, it's kind of a doctrinal issue not to be a jerk to one another, isn't it? Well, then what does that mean? That we can't call out false teaching or bad doctrine? No, I never said that. It's funny how people jump to that conclusion because for some people, they don't know any other way to deal with things they disagree with other than to become a jerk. And that speaks more to them than to how we're supposed to behave. So let me just say this to you. If the only way you know how to deal with someone that you disagree with or that you think is, is believing some falseness or something that you don't agree with, if the only way you know how to deal with that is to be a mean jerk to him, then you got a problem, okay? Because look at what this text says. 
It says, though you may have to reprove your fellow citizen, do not incur sin because of him. So you may have to do that. There may be times when you might have to say to someone, hey, I'm not sure about that, or I disagree with you on this. But, and you can do that, but doesn't give you a license to treat them with uh, evil intent or with meanness or lack of charity. And that's something that we have to know, okay? Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against any of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now you might say, well, wait a second. How does this play out? (sighs) Think of it like this. Every one of us at one point in time has done or said something stupid. How do we want our fellow uh, believers in Christ, our fellow Catholics to respond to us when we do that? How do you want someone to respond to you when you've made a mistake or when you've said something dumb, which I do all the time. You know, I, I, I want people to respond to me with charity, with grace. And this is the biggest thing, I think. I want people to give me the benefit of the doubt, to, to assume good from me, not evil. And this is the biggest problem that I see in our, in our culture today when it comes to how we interact with one another, especially like strangers online. There's a certain type of person that doesn't want to ever assume good. They're always suspicious. They're always out to catch you in something. They're always saying, aha, yeah, I knew I couldn't trust you. And it's funny because you'll see that. Someone will make a comment about somebody, and then there'll be other comments. Yeah, I knew that guy was a liar. I had a bad feeling about that person. I knew something. It's like everybody wants to have this secret knowledge of how other people are bad. You know what that's called? That's called cherishing a grudge, okay? Okay. You just have this deep-seated suspicion and negative um, starting point with other people. That's, that's not the way we need to be, my friends. I, I don't want people to be that way to me, so I shouldn't be that way to them. We've got to take these things seriously because holiness isn't about, you know, this idea that you've created in your mind of, of your perfect view of everything. Holiness is about, according to this text, how you treat other people. Now, am I saying that you don't have to have the right doctrine of theology? No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that how you treat others is part of that doctrine and theology. And if you think that you've been given a pass on being kind, merciful, gracious, and loving because you think you're smarter than somebody else, then you know what? You're really not. All right. So put that in the category of how we're treating people who are part of our our family and faith, okay? We're to love them and not not treat them badly, even though we might have to reprove them once in a while, okay? It's going to happen. Don't incur sin because of it. Let's look at our responsorial psalm from Psalm 103, various verses here. The Lord is kind and merciful. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my being. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord is kind and merciful. He pardons all your iniquities, heals all your ills, He redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with kindness and compassion. The Lord is kind and merciful. Merciful and gracious is the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in kindness. Not according to our sins does he deal with us, nor does he requite us according to our crimes. The Lord is kind and merciful. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has put our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The Lord is kind and merciful. Man, isn't that good news? Isn't that good news to know that God doesn't treat you like others do who are always keeping track of the the faults that you have and treating you in accordance with that? God doesn't do that. He is kind and merciful. And when I think about what it means to be redeemed by God, to be forgiven by God, to be separated from my sin as far as the east is from the west because of the compassion of God, it makes me grateful for that. And it makes me want to be kind and merciful. And that's, I think, the idea here is we want to be like God, don't we? We, we want to be people who are kind and merciful. If you claim to be godly and holy, but you're not kind and merciful, then, then you're not doing it right. My friends, you're not doing it right. Slow to anger and abounding in kindness. Is that how people would describe you? Would someone look at you and say, yeah, that person is slow in anger and abounding in kindness, merciful and gracious? Or would they say, that person is judgmental, always jumping to conclusions 
and holds grudges. I don't want to be like that, my friends. And if we want to be like God, we have to remember it's not just about how we love God and do the right religious things. It's how we relate to one another that God looks at when he determines our level of holiness. All right, our second reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 23, St. Paul writes these words, Brothers and sisters, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you considers himself wise in this age, let him become a fool so as to become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God. For it is written, God catches the wise in their own ruses. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are in vain. So let no one boast about human beings, for everything belongs to you. Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All belong to you and you to Christ and Christ to God. So this theme here that we're going to see is the world's wisdom versus God's wisdom. Now, the world's wisdom is not to love your enemies or love anyone who has come against you. The world's wisdom is to dominate control and pay people back so they don't get you. But we have to remember, my friends, God is trying to teach us a new way. He's trying to teach us a better way. He doesn't want us to be deceived. And he wants us to remember that our bodies are the temple of God, that he dwells within us. And we need to be a a fitting dwelling place. And if we're acting like jerks to people, that's not a fitting dwelling place. Why? Because the Lord is kind and merciful. And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. We and, and you know what people are, oh, that's about suicide. Okay. Well, think about it in a bigger perspective than that. Okay? Because if you are God's temple, you know what that means about the other person? They are too, if they love God. And if you seek to destroy them, if you seek to to demolish them, friends, you got to remember, treat other people as though they are united to Christ as well. And that will help you in your kindness and mercy because God hasn't just given you mercy. He's given others mercy too, especially the people that you're mad at, right? Think about that from that perspective, that God's kindness and mercy has been extended to them. And are you going to stand in the way of that? But this is not the world's wisdom. The world's wisdom is promotion of self. And I think that's why he says, so let no one boast about human beings, right? Don't don't be talking about, oh, well, this guy's smarter than that guy. Like, I I follow only the right people, and and I'm the smartest whatever, or this person. You know what? We got to take our focus off of the world and put it on Christ. And that's the wisdom of God. So let the world judge you and say that you're a fool. Let the world judge you and say you don't know anything, you're not you know, relevant or um, street smart or whatever it might be. They might look at you and go, oh man, that person is such an idiot. Who cares what the world thinks? We got to stop worrying about the world so much, my friends, and their opinion of us. Now, we are to have a good reputation in the world. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how, how we're to be, to have a good reputation with outsiders, but that isn't about like our wisdom and smarts. They're, they can look at us like we're dumb, but as long as they go, wow, that they're holy, like they treat each other with loving kindness and they're honest and they have integrity. They could, they need to think that about us, but at the same time, you kind of want them to feel like we're a little bit crazy because if they don't, if they're like, yeah, that guy's really super smart and, and he's really super, um, you know, uh, thoughtful in the ways of the world, then I don't know, maybe we're not giving them a good example. We, we want to show them that we follow Jesus, not the ways of this world. And the best way that you can do that is to love your enemies. Oh, man, that makes no sense to anybody in this world other than to those who follow Jesus. Because this world doesn't get that. This world is all about revenge. This world is all about, uh, you know, retribution and vengeance. But Jesus has something far different to say, doesn't he, my friends? And this deals with holiness on a tougher level, right? In the Old Testament reading, we saw, hey, be nice to your friends and your fellow believers. Okay, we can kind of get that. But Jesus is going to take it up again, just like he did last week with the Beatitudes, right? He's going to take it, or not the Beatitudes, just like he did last week with, you know, you have heard it was said, dot, dot, dot. He's going to take it up another notch 
again. So here we go. Alleluia, alleluia. Whoever keeps the word of Christ, the love of God is truly perfected in him. Alleluia, alleluia. Matthew 5, 38 through 48. Jesus said to his disciples, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you. And do not turn your back on one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly father. For he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, What is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now compare that to what he says in the first reading. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Be holy, be perfect. It's the same thing. And in the first reading, it was all about how you relate to those who you would call your brothers and sisters. In the second reading, it's about how you relate to those who are your enemies. Because the Jews were like, okay, we'll treat each other well, but our enemies, they are dogs destined for the pit of hell. And Jesus comes along, though, and says, no, if you really, truly want to experience perfection, if you really, truly want to experience holiness, you've got to be like God, who is kind and merciful, even to those who have come against him. Now, think about that for a second. That's a lot tougher, isn't it? Because when we have a specially just uh, reason for retribution, it's hard to set that aside. But loving your enemies is not worldly wisdom, is it, my friends? It's not. It's God's wisdom. And understand this too. This is not negotiable for believers in Christ. This isn't optional. This isn't like the extra credit level. This is the base level of holiness and Christian perfection is how we treat our enemies. And I think it's because it's so hard, isn't it, that we struggle with this. But we have to remember, we're not going to get anywhere with God until we have learned how to get somewhere with others. Yes, our brothers and sisters, and yes, our enemies. So I want to share with you four truths that I pulled out of this that I think are going to help us in this issue of how to love your enemies. And there's probably more. So if you've got ideas, feel free to leave them in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. The first one is this. When you're dealing with an enemy, don't engage in their bad behavior. Okay, now, This is a hard thing not to do, especially in the world of social media where everyone's got to have a comeback and a comment, but maybe there's even other contexts where this applies. But, you know, I've I've been struggling with this too because I have a lot of people who come against me um, and I don't mind like little um, playful arguments, you know, about comments, about different things or whatever. But, you know, sometimes I'll have people who like will attack me personally and It's hard not to respond. It's hard not to do that because we want to defend. We want to stand up and, and, and push back. And the key about this is when you do that, what are you doing? You're either going, when when you have these situations with these people who have come against you, right? We'll just call them your enemies for whatever reason. That conflict that you're involved in, and I want you to think about this in your own life because there's probably situations where you can relate to this even right now people in your life, that there's some kind of conflict that you've been drawn into. And that conflict is either going to feed itself or it's going to be smothered. And, and the way that it feeds itself is by enticing you to participate. So if you participate by responding, then you have contributed to that situation persisting. So number one, don't engage in their bad behavior. When someone's coming after you, just disengage, right? This is what Jesus is saying, right? Offer no resistance to the evil one. That means don't engage them. Don't fight back. Don't push back. Don't defend yourself. Don't come back against them, even when you can. And that's really hard not to. But I can tell you this. 
you will have a lot of moments in your life where you will regret the way you responded to someone when you've been in that heated emotional state of being attacked. You're going to respond, and then later you're probably going to regret it. I highly doubt that you will um, regret not responding, okay? And, and I've been through this, okay? I, I've had situations where people have attacked me, and I've just thought, okay, what am I going to do here? I've got, a, I've got a zinger ready to go. I've got, you know, a greater level of truth that could be revealed that would, that would really just humiliate that person or um, just put them in their place. But when we pray about it sometimes, like the Lord says, no, don't do that. And I have, I have responded inappropriately at times in those situations and have regretted it and have had to apologize and have had to confess. And, and then I've also had situations where I've said, you know what, I'm just, I'm just out. I, I'm not engaging with this person. I'm going to let them have the last word. And, uh, you know, I, I, Can't think of a time where I've regretted that. So there's a little bonus tip to number one, don't engage in their bad behavior. And I'll I'll say it like this. If you are, if let's say you do find yourself in an argument with somebody and it's getting really ugly and it's like, okay, now you're not just like rebuking, but there's sin involved here because, you know, whatever, they're attacking you. Let them have the last word. And um, I've started like trying to do that on YouTube a little bit with comments and stuff. Like someone will hit me in this and, and there'll be times where I'll just say, Here's my response to what you said to try to like, if they are needing clarification or whatever, but I can tell that it's not going anywhere. I'll just say, you can have the last word. And then you know what happens all the time? When you do that, they can't handle it. They can't handle it. They, 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 because they're trying to feed on that conflict. So it doesn't work if you don't engage, you see? See, if you don't engage their bad behavior, then they don't get to to fight you back. And some people, that's like their whole purpose in life. They just love that. They feed off that kind of negative energy and that kind of conflict. And if you don't do that, it's just like the bully at school. You know, if the, if the, if the bully can get a rise out of you, he's going to keep getting a rise out of you. He's going to keep bullying you. But if he can't, or she can't, then usually they disengage and find somebody else, a different target, because that kind of broken person. And that's really what that is. That's a, that's a, a picture of a broken person who. And you can see it in people. There are some people that if you look at their interactions with others, they are typically defined by conflict and they're always out kind of looking for the next person they can get into a fight with. And for whatever reason, it's brokenness. they, They feed off that. If you don't engage, then they have to move on. So really this is from a practical perspective, kind of the best way to respond is not to respond. So number one, don't engage their bad behavior. Now, number two, I'm going to kind of contradict myself here. Respond. Okay. I said, don't respond, but here's how you should respond. Respond to their evil with kindness, right? This is the whole Jesus saying, uh, if someone wants to take your, your tunic, hand them your cloak as well. If they want you to go one mile, go two miles. If somebody's like after you for something, respond, whatever, whatever way this plays itself out in your life, respond to their evil toward you with kindness toward them. Sometimes you hear people re, uh, referring to this as killing them with kindness. And I don't know if that's fair to say, because if you have an ulterior motive, then that's probably not fully kind. But truly, if you can, how you can, and I'm not saying you always can, but respond to their evil with kindness. So that might look like this. You know, that person that's been talking trash about you, you know, if you have an opportunity, say something nice about them. Or that person that has been, um, you know, just ripping you off. Give them something and do it anonymously. You know, whatever. I don't know. Like, find ways to respond to evil with kindness. And you'll be surprised at what can happen. I mean, it, it, can, it can really change things. Because people aren't expecting that and they're not used to that. And they really don't know what to do. And the fact is this. When, when we can recognize that a lot of times the negative behavior that is being pushed at us really isn't about us. It's about that broken person. And one of the reasons why they're engaging in that behavior is because they're hurting. I mean, you've all heard the old adage, hurting people hurt people. And it's true. So when someone is just full of, of, of hatred and negativity and angst and anger, and it, and it is spilling out on everybody, it's a pretty good indication that there's some kind of deep wound inside that person. And maybe in order for that person to experience uh, healing, they need someone, maybe they need you to 
receive that that evil, but then respond with kindness. Remember, we talked a couple weeks ago about what it means to be meek. When Jesus says, and the meek shall inherit the earth, blessed are the meek, right? Meekness, again, we define it as um, the ability to absorb evil and not respond with evil, right? To be able to, to receive that and go, okay, you know, I'll respond with goodness, um, which is definitely countercultural and not part of the world's wisdom. But you might see an opportunity to help another person heal from some woundedness and something that is inside them that is making them so bitter and angry and mean. Now, that's a hard thing to do when you are the one receiving that. But maybe God wants to use you, friend, to, to do that. But he can't if you are going to just feed that negativity with more evil behavior. So, so the best way is to respond to evil with kindness. And I'm sure there are plenty of examples that you can think of in your own life of how that might work itself out. Okay, the next, number three, everyone gets this one, right? Pray for those who, who persecute you. How to love your enemies? Pray for them. Now, let's talk about that prayer. Okay, oh Lord, just smash their face. No, I don't know that that's really the necessarily the right attitude. But like, pray for them the way you would pray for your loved ones, I think is the idea that Jesus is saying. Okay, pray for them to find healing. Pray for them to be blessed. Pray for them to experience God's, uh, God's mercy. And meet it from your heart, right? Not, Lord, you know I don't want to do this, but I got to pray for that person. No, I mean, like, as a gift of love. Like, you would never say to somebody, well, I'm praying for you, if that wasn't, like, meant to be a good thing. So, mean it as a good thing. Like, offer, it, offer some prayer time for people that are treating you in evil ways, okay? Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, Keith, but you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. Um, look, you're right, I don't know. And some of, these, some of these things that we're dealing with are so painful and difficult that it's really, diff it's really hard. And I would say this, number four is this, leave them to God. Leave them to God. And this is really the ultimate point, okay? Is, is that, you know, he says for... He makes his sun rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Now, this doesn't mean that God doesn't care. It just means that God's got a plan and he's going to work this stuff out. And that it's not your job to be his instrument of retribution and punishment. God will handle that. Do you trust him? Do you trust that whatever injustice is being done to you, that God is big enough and smart enough to take care of that. If you do recognize that, then let it go so that God will deal with that. Remember what the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He will repay. So if you're just hell bent on seeing someone get what they've got coming to them, okay, but let that be God's deal, not yours. That's the ultimate point. I think Jesus is saying, look, your job isn't to dish out all of this justice and retribution. That's God's job. Your job is to dish out mercy and kindness. Because guess what? God's going to do that too. And if you really truly are praying for that person, you're going to want them to receive that. Friends, this is holiness. And it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. Now, how can we do this? Okay, I just kind of told you how to love your enemies. Those are very practical things. But like how emotionally can you do this? Because you might just be like so hurt that it's tough. I would tell you this, the best way for you to, to live in this worldly or the best way for you to live in this type of holiness, I think is to recognize that you have received mercy. To recognize that for all of the, the, anxiety you have about what other people have done to you, there's probably somebody out there feeling the same thing about you because none of us is perfect. There's probably people out there that are just like, I don't know how I can relate to Keith Nestor. He's been such a jerk to me. You know, how can I forgive him? How can I forgive him? And, 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 you know, Lord, forgive me for that. That's the truth that we've all received mercy as well. So we can't put ourselves above those others that need mercy. We've got to put ourselves right square in the, in the middle of that. And recognizing that is going to help a lot in this. So fall on the mercy of God for yourself. And when you do, just like Jesus says, he who has been forgiven much loves much. You know, think of that person who, that woman who came into where Jesus was and just poured out everything she had on him and, and, 
they looked at her and everyone was self-righteous, was like, do you know what she's done? And Jesus was like, this is beautiful because she has the capacity to love more than, than you do because she knows that she's received mercy. Friend, do you know that you have too? Like that's something that you can focus on to help you with this. So focus on the need for mercy that you have when, it, when you think about your relationship with God and then also focus on the mercy that God has for you and for others and recognize that holiness and perfection is lived out in how we treat other people. Yes, both our brothers and sisters in Christ and our quote-unquote enemies. God cares about both of those things. He cares about that in you because indeed his desire is that you'd be holy as he is holy and he is kind and merciful. May we be kind and merciful as well. Friends, thanks so much once again for joining me here on Unpacking the Mass. It's always an honor and a privilege to be with you. I want to thank you, uh, say thank you to all my patrons who support uh, this ministry and allow me to do things like this, to take my time and to make these videos and go through these studies. Uh, you guys are uh, incredible. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, I want to thank all of you for watching this. Please make sure you share it and like it. And if you're listening on a podcast, please give us a five-star review and help push this out to more people. I pray that these readings will help you as you come into this week's Mass with ears to hear and a heart to receive. Thank you so much for being here, friends. Take care and God bless.